Good afternoon. This event is being closed captioned. Please click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen to turn on closed captioning. I'm Gigi Dopico, co-chair of the Women's Leadership Forum and vice provost at NYU, and it's my great privilege to welcome you. Today's program is jointly sponsored by the Office of Global Inclusion's Global Scholars and Innovators series, by NYU Libraries and the NYU Press, and by the NYU Women's Leadership Forum. Please watch your emails over the next few weeks for another election-related Women's Leadership Forum program featuring some of the outstanding women faculty from our Department of Politics. Some dates. This year, we commemorate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. We know that all women did not benefit equally from its passage and that equal rights were not so equal, especially for Black women or, for that matter, Black men in the American South. Not quite 50 years later, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 enfranchised hundreds of thousands of voters and drew attention to the widespread problem of voter suppression in the US. Fast forward another 50 years and the assault on access to the ballot box for people of color, for the poor, for the elderly continues. Less than 20 days away from a national election that will determine this country's future and amid baseless claims of rigged elections and voter fraud, never have the stakes of voting or voting rights seemed so high. Never has the critically important work of Professor Gilda Daniels been more urgent. It is our great honor to have her here today. Some brief thanks, first and foremost, to all the frontline workers who are helping us through these difficult times, to President Andrew Hamilton and Provost Catherine Fleming, to the steering committee of the Women's Leadership Forum, especially my extraordinary co-chair, Karen Nersmessian, to everyone at NYU Libraries and NYU Press, and to the brilliant director of the press, Ellen Chodash, and finally, to the whole team at the Office of Global Inclusion, in particular, Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver and NYU's Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Lisa Coleman. And now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Coleman, who will present our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gigi. It's a pleasure. Welcome, everyone, and echoing uh, Gigi's sentiments. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lisa Coleman. I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation and the Chief Diversity Officer. And we're very excited about this program. So thank you again. First, similar to what Gigi just said, I hope everyone is taking really good care of themselves out there. Uh, sometimes people are saying what we're experiencing is the new normal. And I've been saying, no, no it may be uh, unusual to be sure. And it's certainly a disruption. And how we figure out how to navigate disruptions, I think, is uh, increasingly important. And so I hope that everyone is taking really good care and remember, during these times, we have to put on our, our oxygen masks first before we take care of others. Again, picking up on Gigi's comments, I would like to take a mo moment to honor all of the people who, the frontline workers, the people behind the scenes, the people who are working to clean up the hospitals and the homes, et cetera. Thank you for all the work that you're doing during this COVID-19 pandemic. We know that we are experiencing a pandemic on top of pandemics. So thank you to um, all of the people who are doing very hard work during this time. I also want to take time to honor those whose lives have been lost in acts of violence, anti-Black violence, racism, and xenophobia. I'd also like to take an on a time to honor those whose lives have been lost most recently by acts that we've seen. And also to honor our ancestors, including the indigenous peoples and lands upon which we all sit and occupy and also to acknowledge the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on particular communities, particularly uh, indigenous African people with disabilities, uh, indigenous and women. So please take, me a, please take a moment with me for 10 seconds of silence to, to reflect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this afternoon, as I said, we're very excited about this series. And as Gigi mentioned, this series is part of our offices, the Office of Global Inclusion's Global Scholars and Innovators series, or GSI. 
It is also part of our NYU Women 100 program, highlighting as Gigi mentioned women and the work that they've been doing, particularly uh, highlighting those who did not get the right to vote during the 19th Amendment ratification. So we're particularly happy to have uh, Gilda Daniels here today. The GSI series spotlights artists, writers, leaders, and innovators, and scientists who's often whose work is uh, is often pathbreaking and foundational within their own disciplines and fields. The series aims to engage transdisciplinary scholarship toward taking action and creating social change for equity. The GSI series is part of our NYU Be Together initiative, and that's a new action-oriented university-wide initiative that builds upon the lessons that we learned from our own internal uh, being at NYU assessment. Many of the global scholars and innovators uh, events have been complemented by the NYU Reed selection. And thank you to the Office of the Provost, in particular, Gigi and Ryan Pointer. Uh, we, of course, featured Just Mercy, a story of justice and redemption by NYU Law, uh, Aronson family professor of criminal justice, Brian Stevenson. And the NYU Reads and the Global Scholars and Innovators Series are part of the action initiatives announced by President Hamilton and the NYU Board of Trustees. So thank you to President Hamilton, uh, the Board of Trustees, and of course to Katie Fleming for her ongoing support as well from the Office of the Provost. NYU Be Together brings together all of our NYU sites, campuses, and schools to just to, to treat, well, strategically foster and sustain more equitable and inclusive connection systems and structures as we embark on our interconnected futures. We we hope that you will join us. We have lots of committees. If you'd like to join, please, please let us know. Today, we're especially excited for this partnership. Um, and of course, as I, I also want to make sure we thank the libraries. Thank you to our partners, and in particular, Austin Booth. Uh, and of course, to NYU Women's Leadership Forum. It is terrific to partner with you. And very special thanks, of course, to Vice Provost Gigi and, of course, Associate Vice Provost Karen Narcissian for their leadership as co-chairs of the Women's Leadership Forum. The Women's Leadership Forum is a, is a presidential initiative that fosters leadership development, facilitates professional growth and sponsors opportunities for outreach among women currently in leadership roles at NYU, as well as those who aspire to leadership roles within the university. Uh, and those of you who know me, I'm totally committed to leadership. So this program is extremely important as we think about our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts across NYU. Today's program is uh, open to the entire community, and we are delighted to share this opportunity with our NYU Global Network. I'd also like to spend, uh, just say thank you and hello to all of our campus partners from around the world. So Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, and all of our sites. We uh, hope that you too will enjoy this. And we know some of you have started your own Women's Leadership Forum initiatives in, uh, in, in those locales. And as I've already said, uh, thank you to particular to our division of libraries and, and Liz Varelli and Sean Smith Cruz, as well as Austin Booth. And we're especially, of course, grateful, as Gigi meant to, mentioned, to Ellen Chodish from NYU Press. Uh, thank you to our terrific partners, uh, in, and of course, to my team in uh, the Office of Global Inclusion. Let me just say again, thank you to Karen Jackson Weaver, Autumn Rain, uh, Luis, Ati, on my entire team in the Office of Global Inclusion, as well as all of our partners who have and the communications and media team, because we wouldn't be able to do this. Please make sure to visit NYU Press's homepage to obtain a copy of Professor's book, Professor Daniel's book, at a special rate. So please get it. I have it right here. So please get her book. And now the reason you are here with us all this afternoon, I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished speaker for this afternoon's program, Professor Gilda Daniels. Professor Gilda Daniels is a voting rights expert and former deputy chief in the U.S. Department of Civil Rights Division voting section, where she served in both the Clinton and Bush administrations. She is currently a professor of law at the University of Baltimore Law School and the director of litigation for advancement of National Office, a multiracial civil rights organization. Uncounted, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America is her first book. Published in January by New York University Press, it has already been called a roadmap and a call to arms for what participants and what Daniels, Daniels calls the, right to, the fight to vote. The book is a valuable resource for all participants in civic life. Daniels offers a rigorous historical narrative rooted in lived experiences that leaves readers with an understanding of the centrality of the right to vote and the severity of the threats to that right. 
Her book is considered a must read for anyone seeking to understand the status of American democracy today. And as Gigi mentioned, we know what's at stake today in terms of voting. And we also know that women are crucial to the uh, vote that as we move forward with this election year. So we're excited for this program. We're excited that the Women's Leadership Forum is as a part as our partner here. And we're especially excited to welcome Professor Daniels to the NYU community and look forward to her lecture this afternoon. Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver from my office will be moderating the question and answer period. You can start to put questions in as soon as Professor Daniels starts. I'd like to welcome her to, to the stage as it were now. And thank you again for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm waiting. I turned on my camera and my mic. I'm, I've been waiting for someone, some tech person to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make sure we have it all set so she's on camera. Tech team. There we are. There we are. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. And so thank you to Dr. Jackson Weaver and certainly for all the work that you do all the time. Uh, but particularly, thank you for having me today. Thanks so much to NYU, NYU Press, uh, Vice Provost Gigi, and all others who are associated with this effort. Uh, it is very important and valuable. And again, I just want to thank you as an alum of NYU Law. Uh, I am so excited to speak uh, to you today. Uh, I was also, a, I was a Ruth Tilden Scholar at NYU Law and graduated a while ago, uh, but uh, it really enjoyed my uh, time uh, at New York University uh, and have um, friends who are sending their children <laughs> to uh, NYU uh, now. And I have a high school senior <laughs> who's also looking uh, at NYU and other schools. So again, I'm so excited to be here and thank you so much for having me. Thank you to NYU Press uh, for publishing uh, my book, uh, Uncounted. Uh, and it was uh, certainly, and all the persons at NYU uh, Press, including Betsy uh, Steve uh, and uh, Clara Platter. Let's see. Let's get this moving. <clears throat> so I wrote the book, so I'm really excited that NYU Press um, published um, my work and the book, I wrote the book because I like to connect the dots. Uh, I loved playing with those uh, pages, they were essentially coloring pages that had numbers on them, where you had to go from one to two to three to four, just numbers on a page, but you had to connect the dots in order to see a clear picture. That is what I hope that this book does. And that is, I hope that it connects the dots so that we can see what voter suppression looks like in our country and certainly uh, in, in what it looks like in this uh, democratic uh, government that we say that we have. And I, I use, I'm hoping that um, uh, this book can certainly serve as a uh, framework for discussion on voter suppression as well as uh, as, as solutions, uh, because and then only highlight uh, firsthand accounts of uh, voter suppression throughout the book, but also talk about what we should do and what we can do in order to eliminate it uh, from our society. I talk about the various cycles of progress and regress, and I in my my writing uh, certainly is uh, focused on the connections between race, law, and democracy. And I think we can't talk about um, uh, voter suppression or talk about democracy unless we talk about certainly our history and the history that we have in this country. And it certainly starts with the founding father. So as we connect the dots, certainly we have to talk about um, history. And, this, and I said we have this paradoxical democracy uh, we, on the one hand, say that all men are created equal, while at the same time create this second class citizenship, right? We created a caste system where we said that enslaved persons would only be counted as three fifths of a person. So three out of five enslaved persons were counted for purposes of apportionment, meaning for, for determining how many 
representatives would come from a particular state and represent that state in the United States House of Representatives. So from the outset, we decided that we were going to count black bodies as less than those of white bodies for the purposes of voting. And we continued that for almost 100 years right, until we got to the Civil War and the Civil War Amendments. We passed the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, the 14th Amendment, gave us equal protection under the laws, and the 15th Amendment gave uh, Black men the right to vote. It essentially said that citizens of the United States could not be denied the right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And Black men were given the vote under the 15th Amendment, and they embraced it and certainly used it uh, to better their communities. Uh, black men were elected on the local, state, and federal levels. Um, historians say that approximately 2,000 uh, black men were elected, certainly in the formerly uh, Confederate states, in this very short window of reconstruction that lasted less than 20 years. And in that time, we had uh, persons elected certainly to the local, state, and federal levels. And in fact, Mississippi, the state of Mississippi, elected two African-Americans to the United States Senate. We have not had two African-Americans elected to the United States Senate since the 1880s, 1890s. We only have three African-Americans in the United States Senate today. That's Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, and Tim Scott, who's from South Carolina. And so from 1890s to 2020, we've only had a net gain of one African-American to the United States Senate. But to show you how, how important and how much certainly African-American men embrace the right to vote is, is to show you that two African-American men were elected uh, to the United States Senate from the state of Mississippi. And then you had states like South, South Carolina, which elected persons to the, to the state Supreme Court. And, and throughout the South, certainly you had uh, lieutenant governors and others, uh, but also on the local level, on the school boards and the city councils and the sheriff's offices. So those were elections that, uh, that occurred and empowered uh, African-Americans and certainly the African-American community. But there's a subtitle in my book that I, it's called Free at Last, Not So Fast because the period of Reconstruction was short-lived, and we also saw that this period where uh, Blacks were electing to uh, high levels of offices, as well as local offices, uh, came to an abrupt end uh, with the Hayes-Tilden Compromise uh, that occurred. And the, 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 the compromise was that uh, the federal government would remove federal troops from the South, which was providing certainly the protection that was needed for uh, black men to actually cast a ballot. As also a part of the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, uh, the, uh, the states had to adopt the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So they conducted constitutional conventions, and in those constitutional conventions, they not only adopted the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but they also adopted disenfranchising devices, such as a poll tax, literacy test, grandfather clauses, felon disenfranchisement. And you're hearing a lot about felon disenfranchisement, and we'll talk about that later as well. Uh, but, they poll but they had a poll tax, and, and a grandfather clause essentially said that if your grandfather voted prior to uh, the passage of the 15th Amendment, then you could vote. So that meant that so, certainly persons who were uh, enslaved um, prior, uh, prior to the passage of the uh, 13th Amendment did not have a grandfather who was able to vote and could not vote because of the grandfather clauses and other devices uh, that were um, uh, put in place. And so we also had the 19th Amendment. So you had the 15th Amendment. We've celebrated 150 years of the 15th Amendment that gave Black men the vote, but you saw that in early 1900s, uh, the, that, that was essentially removed, so much so 
uh, that those devices, the poll tax, the literacy test, were very impactful. Uh, an example was in Alabama where um, there were more than 140,000 black men who were uh, registered to vote in 1890s. Uh, and by 1906, because of the poll tax literacy tests and uh, grandfather clause in, in 1906, there were only 46 black men who were registered to vote. So we went from 140,000 in the 1890s to 46 who were able to vote. So that sh again shows you, you've seen the power of gaining the vote, but also the power of the uh, laws that were passed to take that right away and certainly to suppress the vote. At the same time, you had certainly had the passage of the 19th Amendment, two decades later, the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And in fact, more than 8 million women voted in the 1920 presidential election. But, you, but it, and while you had Native Americans who weren't considered, who, who were considered citizens for the first time, citizens for the first time in 1924. Uh, and you, in the Southwest, you had certainly laws that were being passed that were preventing uh, Latinx persons from uh, casting uh, a ballot. And, you, and, and while the 19th Amendment was passed uh, in 1920, not all women, as you know, received the right to vote. I use in my book, uh, my grandmother as a framework. My grandmother lived to be 99 years old. She passed away in 2019. She was born in 1919. In, 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 and she should have received the right to vote in the 1940s, but she's an African American, she was an African American woman who lived in the South, who lived in Louisiana, and did not get the right to vote until uh, the 1960s. And we see that Dr. King actually spoke on certainly these disenfranchising devices and these what he called conniving methods that were being used to prevent uh, African Americans from registering to vote. Um, so you had the 15th Amendment, you had the 19th Amendment that gave white women the right to vote, but certainly women in the South, women of color in the South were prevented from uh, voting because of these conniving methods. And it was women like my grandmother, but also women like Ms. Myrtle Pless Jones, who, who was a graduate of South Carolina State University and got a master's degree from Michigan State University, was married, had two children, and lived in Montgomery, Alabama. She went to register to vote in the 1950s, and in order to register, she was asked, how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? She replied, around 100. She was told that that answer was incorrect, and was told that she would not be able to vote on that day. There are also stories in New York State. In New York State, Ms. Maria Luisa Jimenez migrated from Puerto Rico in 1951 to New York State, where she had to take a literacy test before she could cast, before she could register and cast a ballot. So we had literacy tests Certainly, it, 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 not only uh, in the South, but in places like New York that were preventing certainly black and brown people from registering and from voting. And it wasn't until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was almost 100 years after the passage of the 15th Amendment. So you had the passage of the 15th Amendment to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was certainly another watershed moment. It's been called monumental and President Ronald Reagan said it was a crown jewel and certainly impacted and advanced the ball uh, in, order, in, in regards to the act of voting in these United States of America. It was very important as you can see from this slide that there were uh, certainly that blacks in places like Mississippi were prevented from registering because of those literacy tests, poll taxes, uh, and other methods, and as well as economic terror uh, and uh, violence. Uh, people died uh, for attempting to register. People were killed for attempting to register. We've seen the pictures of uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, as he and Hosea Williams, Reverend Hosea Williams, uh, attempted to lead a group 
to march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, and the violence that ensued uh, at the hands of, of, the, of the officials. Uh, and so in places like Mississippi, where less than 10% of uh, African Americans were registered prior to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we see that after the Voting Rights Act, uh, certainly 20 years or more after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we see a fundamental shift in the ability of Blacks to register and participate in the uh, voting process. We not only saw a shift in registration, but you also saw an you also you also saw exponential growth in the elections of candidates of color. Uh, that, that, that it was uh, um, the, the certainly the impact of the Voting Rights Act was uh, humongous and certainly uh, monumental. Uh, nonetheless. Even with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we continue to see barriers to the ballot. And although historically we might have called them poll taxes or literacy tests, or even vouchers where a white person had to vouch for a black person in order for them to uh, register or cast a ballot, that, that, that may be what they were called historically, but now we certainly have some contemporaneous examples of voter suppression. And voter suppression is, <laughs> real. We see it with uh, voter ID and voter deception, as well as voter intimidation tactics that continue, that continue today. Uh, one certainly area of voter suppression is certainly felon disenfranchisement, where a state can determine if what particular crimes will cause a person to lose their right to vote. And this became a, certainly what certainly was established in large part uh, after the uh, uh, passage of the 15th Amendment, and certainly during those constitutional conventions which occurred in the early 1900s. States like Mississippi said, what kind of crimes do black men generally commit? And so they decided that crimes such as wife beating and timber theft would cause you to lose your right to vote, but murder and rape would not. And we've seen, certainly from the 1900s to today, that there is there continues to be a disproportionate impact, certainly adverse impact on, uh, on, on people of color in regards to the felon disenfranchisement laws. Uh, we've recently seen in the state of Florida where the people of Florida sought to remedy this problem because in Florida, more than 1.4 million people cannot cast a ballot because of previous conviction of felony and that Florida essentially it serves as one of the states that permanently disenfranchises. Yet the people of Florida uh, put on the ballot an initiative, put on the ballot a constitutional amendment in Amendment 4 that would restore the right to vote to those persons, to more than 880 of 80,000 of those persons. Uh, but despite passing Amendment 4, uh, the legislature said free at last, not so fast and essentially said, you cannot register until you have completed your uh, fees, fines, and restitution. And for many people, this is an astronomical uh, 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 event and, uh, and impossible for many of them to pay those fines before they can vote. That is being litigated and continues to be, but serves as an example of how uh, the, the, the rules change and how the laws are changing and continue to to suppress uh, the right to vote. And, and felon disenfranchisement serves as a, a, certainly serves as a continual example of voter suppression and how you can connect the dots from all men are created equal, this paradox of all men are created equal and the, certainly the three-fifths compromise to felon disenfranchisement in a state like Florida where Three-fifths was about was counting only about 60% of African Americans and the and the way that Florida implements its felon disenfranchisement laws arrives at approximately the same percentage of blacks actually having the right to vote. So the names may have changed, um, but the but the certainly impact remains the same. And today we're also seeing certainly issues around vote by mail and the use of the postal service as well as the militarization uh, of the polling place, right? Calls uh, by this administration to 
uh, have uh, persons watching the polls and to militarize having paramilitary people uh, available are all certainly things that we have seen before. Certainly we've seen the violence and intimidation um, of the past. And this is just, again, a contemporaneous example of how uh, votes uh, can be suppressed uh, and how we need to continue to work uh, to, and certainly in this, this fight to vote uh, for the right to vote. So what are some of the solutions, <laughs> right? The solution is certainly to vote. You, and certainly in talking to uh, campuses across the country, uh, certainly looking at how important it is for uh, uh, students to register and vote. And I tell students all the time, if you care about issues of gender equality or criminal justice reform or climate change or racial equality, then you must vote. Uh, if, you're, if you were concerned about uh, certainly the, the, the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery, then you need to, you can see how you can move from protest to power. You move from protest uh, to power by certainly casting your vote. And you can do that, certainly you can see that in places like Georgia, where in Georgia, if you're concerned that the sheriff did not arrest the murderers of Ahmed Arbery until months later, or that the district attorney, the county attorney did not press charges, guess what? In Georgia this year, you can elect the sheriffs for all of the counties. You can elect the county attorneys for all of the counties. And that's a way to put to, to put some feet on your protest, right? Some power, and certainly protests are power, but moving from pro protest to power in regards to casting your ballot on and, and impacting these issues that you care so much about, that we all care so much about. I tell people we have to do four things. Educate, legislate, litigate, participate. Educate yourselves about voter registration deadlines. What's the process for voting? When, is, when, are, when does early voting occur? What do I have to do in order to cast my uh, vote by mail, right? So, or what time is the early, and where are the sites for early voting? Uh, what, is, what, are, what times and where are the sites for, for voting on, a, on, a, on November 3rd? Educate yourselves, tell your friends, make sure your family's registered and make sure that they vote and have a plan to vote. But you have to educate ourselves about this process, particularly about the process of voting by mail and ensuring that we are doing it all, that we are all doing it correctly because there is a high rate of rejection of, of for certainly for those vote by mail ballots that are not um, completed correctly. So it's important to follow instructions for the vote by mail. Uh, also, I'd say educate and then legislate. Legislate, know what federal, state, and local um, laws are being proposed and being passed. There have been at least two bills that have been on Mitch McConnell's desk for more than 100 days, one of them more than 200 days, that will impact, that certainly could, could positively impact the ability of uh, localities and counties and states to ensure that they have proper uh, PPEs and proper equipment for uh, casting, uh, for certainly counting ballots. And those are things that we need to be uh, proactive about and making sure that we know what legislation is being proposed and contacting our representatives to ensure that it's moving forward. Also, litigate, partner with organizations. You all are doing internships uh, and externships. Certainly make sure you're doing those and, and, and would certainly recommend doing those with uh, organizations that are working on the issues that you care uh, that you care about. Uh, organizations like Advancement Project and NAACP, LDF, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, Deimos, and others. Uh, and finally, participate. Become a poll worker. And that's been the clarion call, certainly for folks to be, be more, uh, certainly be to be, be, be active and becoming poll workers is very, very important in participating in this process. Now, I just want, to, want to end by saying that it is very important that we understand that this is not just a, this is not a black and white issue. This is a democracy issue. 
Um, so the, 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 the fact that we have had and endured uh, voter suppression and is seeing it certainly today uh, at heightened uh, levels uh, that and it, and it must be addressed and we're all trying to address it certainly legislatively and also as well as uh, through litigation and there's these are the times that we live in uh, and these are the these are the times where we are being called to action uh, and and called to creating the democracy that we want to see one where all people can participate freely, fairly, and without discrimination. That's the job that I'm doing. That's the job I'm asking you to continue to do by educating, legislating, litigating, and participating. And it is one that we can all achieve in this fight to vote for the right to vote. So I want to thank you for having me uh, today. I hope you uh, could purchase the book. We have a lot of information in the book as well. Uh, and I've thoroughly enjoyed my time today and I'm ready to answer uh, any questions uh, that you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor, Professor Daniels, for that illuminating and provocative lecture. We are so excited to have you here at NYU. Uh, there are a number of questions that have already started to come in to the chat. And I just want to thank you for that wonderful presentation and for the historical components that you highlighted, as well as the contemporary context and implications of that. I, I read the book and was particularly struck by the stories that you told and the accounts that you gave. Uh, you mentioned your grandmother, and it made me think about my mom. Um, and we lost my mom uh, when I was doing my doctoral work in the 1990s. But she talked about growing up in the 60s and having to pay a poll tax in order to vote. So I was struck by the voter registration rates and how they were low in states like Mississippi, Alabama, and Virginia. And she was from Virginia. And you could see in the 80s, you know, this huge increase in the number of reg uh, voter registration uh, in, partic in particularly uh, disenfranchised communities, communities of color. So, so we see that. And one of the questions in the chat, actually, it's a two-part question, if I may ask, really highlights the significance of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Can you talk a little bit more about when that act was passed and, and why it was so significant? And then there's a question that kind of follows up in the chat about what can we learn or what can we do to be more proactive in terms of protecting vulnerable communities from voter suppression? And we really want to frame that in the historicity of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, its significance, and then what can we do to make sure communities who are vulnerable fight that voter suppression? Great, thank you so much for that question, Dr. Jackson Weaver. Uh, so let's, let's talk about, go back to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As I, as I mentioned, it was the backdrop for the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was certainly all those conniving methods that Dr. King talked about in his Give Us the Ballot speech in 1957, right? The poll taxes, the literacy tests, uh, grandfather clauses and other measures. And, and you had in Texas, the all white primaries. They said, yes, you can, you can vote, but you have to vote in the primaries. And the primaries were only for, it was, they were called all white primaries. <laughs> so essentially, if you were not white, you could not participate in the primaries. And so the Supreme Court had to strike down that in, Smith, in the Smith v. All right and other cases. So, and, and as well as there were, you know, cases on the poll tax and those in, in Harper, versus Virginia, right? And so Virginia, certainly your grandmother was in Virginia, that's certainly where they were certainly enforcing uh, uh, a poll tax until, until the 1960s. And at that time, the poll tax was only a dollar and 50 cents. But the court said that you cannot base the ability to pay uh, on, on whether you can have the right to vote, right? And so the, those kinds of measures were in place, and, the, and it was the attorney general as well as the foot soldiers, right? The civil, the civil rights foot soldiers who were protesting and highlighting, right, the, 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 the uh, certainly the measures that black people and brown people had to take in just to try to register to vote. Um, and um, certainly, that, and that was hi certainly highlighted with the uh, at the march from Selma to Montgomery, and uh, uh, Representative John Lewis and Reverend Hosea Williams and others. And when I think, and so it's, historians say essentially that when uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson saw that, 
saw the violence. Now, if violence had been occurring for the last 50 years, <laughs> right? Uh, violence, had, uh, violence had certainly uh, been occurring, uh, but it wasn't until they saw it and the world saw uh, the violence that was associated with Black people trying to gain a right of citizenship, right? One which they sh were, should have been endowed, right? In regards, to, particularly with the passage of the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment. So it was, you know, so it was that work, the, the protesting as well as the work that was being done to say to Congress, you must pass this. And you had the Attorney General saying that you have to pass this law as well. And the Voting Rights Act had two, had two primary provisions, Section 2, which is a nationwide prohibition against well, vote uh, against the discrimination based on race or uh, uh, language. And it's Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act required jurisdictions that had those low uh, registration rates that you saw in the chart uh, uh, to, and, and that had devices. So it's places like Virginia, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Louisiana, Georgia, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, right? So all are parts of those states as well as parts of uh, other states. Um, uh, and those states had to submit any changes that they made to the Department of Justice for approval. Now, when I was at the Department of Justice, and we, we the Department of Justice received approximately 5,000 submissions a year. So it was but had to review those submissions from those what was called covered jurisdictions to make sure that they did not retrogress, that they didn't put black people in a worse position. And as an example, we, we no longer have section five because of the 2013 Supreme Court case, Shelby County versus Holder. An example of how we miss section five we, can be seen in what happened a couple of weeks ago in the state of Texas. In approximately two weeks ago, the governor of Texas announced that counties in Texas could only have one drop box, one drop box for your mail-in ballot. Now, drop boxes have been, we've been telling people to use drop boxes, particularly if they have concerns about the, the efficacy of the United States Postal Service. So if, you don't, if you're not sure that the Postal Service can get your ballot to the, um, to the elections office, we're telling people, well, everybody has a drop boxes, put them in a drop box. But to, Two weeks ago, with approximately 30 days left before the election, the governor said counties in Texas, now there are more than 250 counties in Texas, he said each of those counties could only have one drop box. Now the county, Harris County, which is where Houston, Texas is, Harris County is the third largest county in these United States of America. And so for the governor to say one drop box for the whole county, Harris County had said they were going to have 12 up until that announcement. Now, all of a sudden, it's a, a, only one. So if, there were, if we had Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, if the Supreme Court had not given us the Shelby County versus Holder decision, then Governor Abbott could have made that proclamation, but it would not have been implemented until the Department of Justice reviewed it to ensure that it did not put uh, black and brown voters in a worse position. And I think we can all agree that going from 12 drop boxes in a county like Harris County to one is a retrogression, <laughs> is regression, right? And that would not have been approved and would not have been implemented. Uh, uh, and, and, and we do have section two, which is the other provision I've mentioned. We do have section two, but that, but that is reactive, whereas section five is, uh, was, was proactive. And reactive in that, yes, lawsuits have been filed uh, and we've had hearings and the courts have essentially said, we're going to let the, the governor's decision stand until we have an opportunity to hear all the arguments and make a decision. So while that's going, while they're hearing, while they're scheduling a date and time to hear all the arguments and make the decision, guess what? There's only one drop box in Harris County. Wow. Wow. Only one drop box in the other county. So that's certainly, and, and, and there are measures that are, the, the House has passed measures that would restore mm -hmm. uh, Section 5 and certainly parts of the Voting Rights Act that were uh, lost, but have, that they, they have not been able to get a hearing in the, in the United States Senate or get any traction. Wow, well, thank you for that, Professor Daniels. I think many of us are shocked and disappointed to hear that type of 
system, systemic and systematic oppression and suppression taking place. And two of the questions, and thank you audience uh, for listening in and for sending in these phenomenal questions, kind of relates to uh, the, the points that you raised about the distinction that takes place within different states throughout the country. So are there models that you can share with us of state laws that are effective or that have been effective? You mentioned Texas and clearly, you know, what the governor has proclaimed is not, you know, ideal. It just doesn't make logistical sense. But are there models of state laws that are effective at countering voter suppression? And then one of the other questions is related to that in terms of how we think about polling and voter registration and the way it differs or varies by different states. And there's a question around whether or not we can think about standardization of voting and polling. Is that something that's even possible with our governmental structure? Oh, wow. These are all yes. great questions. I'm trying to figure out where do we start? Uh, there are models and there, and there are states that are certainly moving in the right direction. That is one that comes to mind is immediately is Virginia. This governor announced that he was making election day a state holiday. Um, so there's a state holiday. Um, so that means that state employees will, will have the entire day to, uh, to go and vote. Uh, they also have approximately 40 days of early voting in uh, Virginia and other places. Uh, and like North Carolina actually mailed out uh, ballots, not just a request, but mailed out ballots to all of their registered voters on September 4th, right? almost 60 days before um, the election. Uh, so there are places that are doing, uh, certainly doing, uh, certainly making it easier for people to uh, access the right to vote. I live in Maryland and in Maryland for the first time we'll have same day voter registration, uh, meaning if you most places have voter registration deadlines, for example, uh, in Virginia, if you didn't register by October uh, 13th, uh, then th that was the deadline to register. Now, that, now I'm also at the um, litigation director at Advancement Project uh, National Office, and we actually filed a lawsuit because their registration system went down on Monday the 13th, and so we filed a lawsuit to extend the deadline. Uh, for for another two days. So if you're in Virginia or know someone in Virginia, you have until uh, uh, tonight uh, to actually register. Um, so there. So, it, but in in Maryland, if you did not register and just forgot about it, didn't have time on election day or during early voting or on election day, you can go to the polls, register, and vote. Right, and so those, so there are places that have same day voter registration. I believe Wisconsin also has same day voter registration. So there are states that are doing doing the right thing. And even in regards to vote by mail, there are five states that only use vote by mail, and they have higher turnout. They have higher turnout than the other states. Like we just saw, saw Georgia started early voting on uh, Monday. Lines, people stood in line. Five, six, there's one accountable person who stood in line, 11 hours. That should not be in a democracy in America. We're trying to be the examples of democracy. Um, there are certainly things that we can do and we need to do better, right? And it's, it's a way of, of suppressing the vote. People were talking about, certainly in Georgia, the enthusiasm that people had. But my concern was for every person who was, in, who was in, in, encouraged or in, enthused by seeing a line wrapped around, <laughs> wrapped around buildings. There is there is, there are people who are saying, I, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I don't have. I can't. I can't spend four hours uh, standing in line. I got kids. I got a job. Those kinds of things. So we have to do better. And there are places that are uh, doing better. There, you can go to websites to see. You know, certainly uh, reports and. Uh, other um, um, uh, data, like from BrennanCenter.org, right? Brennan Center is at, at, at NYU. Uh, BrennanCenter.org, AdvancementProject.org, NAACPLDF.org, ACLU, uh, DEMOS, D-E-M-O-S.org, um, uh, Latino Justice, Pearl Def. There are a number of organizations that have a lot of information, and you can, 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 can certainly uh, 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 certainly talking about what we need to do. And I certainly have uh, examples in my book of uh, measures that I think we need to um, address. And one last thing, uh, Dr. Jackson Weaver, in regards to whether or not we'll see the standardization mm -hmm. 
there are efforts to have an explicit right to vote. You might not know this, but there's no explicit right to vote in the United States Constitution. We have a bunch of thou shalt nots. Mm -hmm. right? Thou shalt not discriminate based on race. Thou shalt not discriminate based on gender. Thou shalt not discriminate based on age, right? But there, but there, but there, there is no nothing in the Constitution that says thou has that you have the right to vote, right? For you look at the Second Amendment, you have the right to bear arms. You have the right to free. You have the right to free speech in the First Amendment, but we don't have an amendment that says you have the right to vote. And there are efforts, uh, Advancement Project, uh, Demos, and others. Uh, there are efforts to get an explicit right to vote in the United States Constitution. And in fact, Senator Durbin uh, presented a resolution that would in fact do that and as well as address uh, the rights of returning citizens uh, to, uh, to cast ballots, uh, particularly in, in federal elections. So there are, there are efforts to try to standardize um, uh, the right to vote, but the Constitution gives the, the the, the power to the states in determining the qualifications of electors. And that essentially means that the Constitution says that the states can decide whether or not you need a voter ID, whether or not you need to be, a, uh, whether or not you need to register 30 days before an election or you can register on the, uh, during the election. So we have this crazy quilt, this is certainly this patchwork of, of laws that make it confusing. And um, I've, I think I've said in the book that it's, it's Unfortunately, it's you know it's easy to get a weapon than it is to get a to get a voter registration <laughs> card. Uh, we need okay. we need to For change sure. that. Yes. We need to change that. Thank you so much, Professor Daniels. We only have about two minutes left, and I just want to get in one other question, if I may. We have, again, just wonderful questions coming in from the audience. Thank you all for being so thoughtful in your questions. I want to encourage you all, too, to visit the NYU Press website to learn more about Professor Daniels' book. Uh, and also, as was mentioned earlier by Vice Provost Topico, stay tuned for different events and activities that are going to be held in partnership with the Women's Leadership Forum, as well as the Office of Global Inclusion and our Be Together initiative. As we close, Professor Daniels, I just wanna highlight what you said in the voter suppression slide and really the call to action that you gave us in terms of being educated, legislating, litigate, participate, right? Educate, legislate, litigate, and participate. And as was mentioned in our welcoming remarks, Just Mercy, a story of justice redemption by NYU's own law professor, Brian Stevens, and that's our NYU Reads selection for this fall term. And it brings together the entire university community. In, in just 60 seconds, if you can, you know, just very briefly, uh, we want to be a community of action. We want everyone listening in to feel like they can listen to this and then really move forward. Do you have suggestions or innovative ways that colleges and university communities can create learning and engagement opportunities for us to really do more to, to promote voter engagement instead of voter suppression. Right. So I would certainly, I think we need to, I think we certainly need to focus on what happens after election day, right? Because it is, and, and, rep, and, rep, and understand that we're dealing with a representative democracy and that we have to continually remind the people that we elect that they work for us. Uh, and so photo, certainly having forums on college campuses, I think would be very important, as well as ensuring that students are uh, understanding that they have, they have the ability to go out and work on election day uh, and, and, and assist uh, or as, you know, work as poll workers, others. So, you know, if, if administrations can grant, uh, certainly excuse absences to students on that day. But I think we also have to make sure that we are also uh, helping our students in their mental health. This is a very toxic situation and very polarized. And whatever happens on November 3rd, there are going to be folk who are going to be very excited and folk who are going to be very upset. And so as we, as, as institutions, can prepare for that and ensure that we can care for our students and care for our faculty, administrators, and other employees to ensure that we all, certainly on the day after, uh, continue to understand that we certainly have work that continues but that we are all certainly supposed to be one United States, <laughs> the United States of America, and work uh, to unite us uh, on so certainly common goals and common values. Um, but we want to look, and, and having a goal of a, of a democracy is certainly important. But I recognize that this fight to vote <laughs> for the right to vote continues, and we uh, these you know, persons to continue to do those things as suggested, right? Educating, legislating, litigating, and participating. And we can do those things every day. 
pray. Those are things we can do every day and uh, uh, make sure that, that we can all try to achieve this more perfect union together. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Daniels. Thank you so much for your work and your research on Uncounted, the crisis of voter suppression in America. I want to thank all of you for listening in and joining us today. And please do stay tuned, visit our websites to be a part of other events that we have coming up in the future. Have a great rest of the day and many thanks again for joining us. Thank you.